Over the holiday season, I saw a strange commercial for a shopping center in Reno. I have never seen an advertisement asking people to go to a shopping center before. Usually, the existence of stores themselves should be enough of a reason to bring people there. But that's not the weird part. The advertisement was hyping up its selection of stores and eateries, but it's nothing special. It's just a bunch of franchise establishments with a massive Walmart at the end of the parking lot. In fact, this shot does a fantastic job showing how much of the space is just parking. I am not exactly impressed by a bunch of stores that look like islands popping out of an asphalt parking lot. The only thing this commercial really showed off is just how car-centric it is to shop around in Reno. Most shopping centers follow more or less the same pattern. They are comprised of big box stores or smaller shops facing inwards towards a parking lot that may take up a larger surface area than the buildings themselves. Everything about the environment is designed to be accessed by cars, with little regard to what it is like being a person trying to shop there. Walking to a shopping center isn't enjoyable. The signs advertising the various businesses are designed to be read while inside of a car, so everything feels out of scale when not driving a vehicle. There may not even be a footpath leading up to the building either. Instead, people are spilled onto the driveways and parking lots as they make their way to the desired location. Since the buildings tend to be behind massive parking lots, it can be fairly time-consuming to walk across the lot to the desired building. If a shopping center is busy, the parking lot can be a hectic or even dangerous place, since someone has to watch out for all the cars that are searching for a parking spot and all the cars that are backing in and out of their spots. It's also annoying for other drivers because they spend a lot of time circling the lot in order to find a good parking spot. If a shopping center is not busy, then the parking lot serves as a reminder for the sheer amount of space that is reserved for cars. Contrast this with a traditional downtown Main Street. Here, storefronts are placed against the sidewalks, so pedestrians walking through the area do not need to feel like they are being dumped onto the car infrastructure as they're making their way around. The stores are also smaller, and they are packed tightly together, so people always have something new or interesting to walk towards. This main street is mostly built for people, while this shopping center is built for cars. One does a far better job encouraging people to walk through the area than the other. Since a car is required to get to a typical shopping center, Americans wind up spending a lot of time driving from one big box store to another whenever they go running errands. In fact, the National Household Travel Survey found nearly 20% of all vehicle trips are for shopping and running errands, making this category the second largest contributor for the total number of vehicle miles traveled. All of this makes the entire shopping experience incredibly dismal. There aren't a whole lot of opportunities to shop around in an environment that allows people to walk from one store to another. If someone really wants to break away from the typical car-centric shopping experience while also being in person, one option is to visit a mall. Malls attempt to simulate a walkable experience by providing stores that are within a pedestrian-friendly corridor. Since the stores are clustered close to each other, much like in a traditional downtown setting, people can walk past many different stores in a couple of seconds. In a way, the mall is an admission that people like walkability, and they enjoy having a centralized location where they can hang out, walk around, or shop around. Unfortunately, since malls tend to be surrounded by massive parking lots, they are a facade. They provide the illusion of walkability with none of the benefits. Malls are just as car-dependent as any other shopping center. It also doesn't even provide all of people's necessities in one centralized location. The shops tend to be dominated by clothing and apparel stores, so if someone has to go grocery shopping and clothes shopping in one day, they would still have to drive to two different stores. To some people, the main benefit of a mall is the function as a third place. A third place is a term coined by Ray Oldenburg, where the first place is where you live, the second place is where you work, and the third place is where you hang out and socialize. The mall is often portrayed as a third place, where teenagers hang out with their friends and people casually walk around the mall, because in this country, we drive to places to walk around. Even Reno's Meadowood Mall had their own mall walkers who would use the space to exercise before the shops opened, and they were even featured on Channel 4 News. 
Tracy Evans started walking at the mall four years ago to lose weight and lower her cholesterol. Since then, her health has improved tremendously. I mean, not even a little trace of cholesterol or any blockage in any of my arteries in my heart. So I was just like 100%. As nice as it was for them, this no longer happens. Instead, Meadowood Mall opens at 10 in the morning when the other stores do. This is where I become hesitant to call a mall a third place. One of the qualities of a third place is not being obligated to spend money, but the purpose of a mall is to attract customers to a unified location where they may shop around and buy more things. It is not designed to be a third place, whereas, dare I say, a bubble of mindless consumerism. There are a lot of insidious design choices that are meant to trick customers into spending more by making unplanned purchases. Named after the father of shopping malls, the Gruen Effect, or the Gruen Transfer, is a phenomenon that turns shopping into an activity that is done for the sake of it. Starting with the box stores on the outside of the mall. These are recognizable storefronts that act as anchor points to draw people into the mall. Between the anchor stores are a bunch of smaller shops which cannot be seen from the outside. This is meant to entice shoppers to enter the mall and see more of what it has to offer. Once inside, a shopper may find a somewhat confusing layout and lose their sense of direction. This is intentional. As the shopper wanders around, they are exposed to more storefronts. One of them may end up catching their eye, so they go in, see what they have, and buy something they didn't originally plan on. Researchers have found that roughly 50% of these purchases are unplanned, and the more someone is exposed to a product, the more likely they are to buy it impulsively. Everything about a mall, right down to how it smells, is intentional in order to maximize spending. Malls may try to replicate a traditional downtown setting, but at the end of the day, they are private companies. They don't want teenagers to loiter, and they don't want elderly people to casually walk around. They just want more people to buy things. There's just one big problem with labeling this the Gruen Effect. The father of shopping malls, Victor Gruen, despises what he created. Two years prior to his death, he gave a speech to the third annual European Conference of Shopping Centers in London, where he said, I would like to take this opportunity to disclaim paternity once and for all. I refuse to pay alimony for those bastard developments. They destroyed our cities. To better understand his animosity, we first have to look at why he created the mall and how it veered away from his original vision. Victor Gruen was a Jewish refugee who fled Nazi-occupied Austria in 1938, and he emigrated to the United States. After the end of the Second World War, America was seeing an economic boom in conjunction with a high demand for new homes, and they began what is known as the Suburban Experiment. These were places like Levittown, Pennsylvania, which consisted of single-family homes that were mass-produced. The suburban experiment was not met with a pilot program, followed by months of surveys. They just built it, and it was rather inescapable. These massive swaths of land were dedicated to these single-family homes where you need a car to get around. Nowadays, we are in the third generation of the suburban experiment, and the suburbs continue to have a lot of the same issues that were present in the first generation. A traditional walkable downtown would be filled with a variety of different points of interest, such as commercial businesses or public spaces within walking distance. This encouraged more people to explore the built environment by foot. And with more people outside, they could actually see each other, leading to more chance encounters. The suburbs, on the other hand, represent fairly isolated communities. Unless someone is walking around for exercise, chances are they are going to need to get into their car and drive whenever they want to go somewhere. This makes it really tempting to just reconstruct the world in your own home. Rather than having communal areas, you have an indoor theater, a man cave, or a pool in the backyard just so you can enjoy these kinds of different amenities without actually having to drive away from your home. Victor Gruen detested the suburbs because you needed an automobile to do just about anything. He said that the car made American cities an unfit, unlivable environment that was inefficient and ugly. It was a far cry from the urbanism found somewhere like Vienna. 
In the 1950s, Gruen gave a speech calling the commercial strips near these post-war suburbs avenues of horror flanked by the greatest collection of vulgarity. Billboards, motels, gas stations, shanties, car lots, miscellaneous industrial equipment, hot dog stands, wayside stores, ever collected by mankind. The suburbs desperately lacked any kind of main street or town square or any kind of focal point that would bring the community together and act as a centralized communal area. Victor Gruen wanted to fill the vacuum created by the absence of social, cultural, and civic crystallization points in these vast suburban areas. Essentially, he wanted to bring Austria-style urbanism to American suburbs, so they can have a centralized location for people to relax and to socialize. This would mean taking a lively downtown experience and bringing it to the suburbs. Gruen envisioned shopping centers having a community center, an auditorium, a children's play area, a large number of public eating places, and, in the courts and malls, opportunities for relaxation, exhibits, and public events. Part of the reason for this is because Victor Gruen himself did not like shopping, so he wanted to build a place that had more to offer than future material possessions. In 1952, the Dayton Company and Victor Gruen Associates began the construction of what is considered the first mall, the Southdale Shopping Center in Edina, Minnesota. Gruen's original plans for the Southdale Center included apartment buildings, houses, schools, a medical center, a park, and a lake. It was meant to be a spot of urbanity in the long suburban stretches, so people can actually break away from the car-dependent nature of the suburbs. However, the development company, Dayton, had other plans. They stripped away everything, the apartments, houses, parks, public spaces, and left nothing but an all-too-familiar site with box stores to attract people to an enclosed space surrounded by an asphalt lot with enough parking to store 5,200 cars. On its opening day, the mall saw 40,000 visitors enter the climate-controlled building, and on the following weekend, there were over 75,000 visitors. This development even captured the attention of architect Frank Lloyd Wright, who toured the Southdale Center shortly after it opened. He was not pleased with the design, saying, You've got a garden court that has all the evils of the village street and none of its charm. He even said Victor Gruen should have left downtown, downtown. It is not exactly fair to blame Victor Gruen here. He actually despised the changes that the Dayton Company made, saying there was a tragic downgrading of quality. His proposal for shopping centers was supposed to be more than just selling machines. Gruen believed that these malls cause long, energy-wasting automobile trips and have no purpose except for merchandising. These shopping malls were not bringing downtown to the suburbs. They were an extension of the suburbs themselves. Suburbanites had yet another place to drive to if they wanted to shop, eat at a food court, hang out with friends, or walk around in an enclosed space. However, by making it so the mall is mainly accessible by car, people who do not have a vehicle of their own lose out on the opportunity to experience a walkable third place for socializing and shopping. Even when a mall is constructed near public spaces, community centers, or residential homes, they are separated by these vast parking lots and roads, creating an unwalkable environment that is both uncomfortable and outright dangerous. It seems like no matter what, you need a car to experience this tiny little hospice away from car-dependent suburbia. Southdale Center represented a town center with no residents and only shoppers. It's a fantasy land where every day was a perfect shopping day, but you needed a car to experience it. In a way, the mall has a lot of the same issues as downtowns that were affected by the suburbanites need to drive everywhere. Rather than being a centralized location people live in and have close access to jobs, entertainment, and necessities, it was a place for suburbanites to drive to and visit. Despite its issues, these shopping centers were insanely popular, and many more of them sprang up all over the country. According to Business Insider, by 1960, there were over 4,500 shopping centers in the United States, which averages to three new shopping centers every single day. By the 1980s, these shopping complexes continued to be built at a rate of over 1,000 per year. These malls even spread to Europe, much to Victor Gruen's dismay. 
He described it as a thoughtless copying of the US model in Europe, a small crowded continent with a population density ten times as high as America, where there was an urgent need to save land. Gruen warned America cannot afford the wastage of land, of time, and of energy which its system of dispersed development creates. Today, it is not exactly a secret that malls are slowly dying. According to real estate research firm CoStar, retailers have closed over 10,600 stores in 2019, which is nearly double the number closed in 2018. They also noted that, at the time, mall vacancies were at an eight-year high. When an anchor store closes in a mall, it has the same effect as a box store closing. Maybe it quickly bounces back when another retailer claims the location, but it usually sits empty for an indefinite amount of time. Without a genuine reason to drive out to the box store, there may not be enough traffic bringing people to the surrounding locations to support the other businesses. Similarly, with a mall, as anchor stores die, fewer people enter the mall, which hurts smaller businesses that need the foot traffic, thus leading to more store closures and more dead malls over time. Ooh, a JCPenney's used to be here. Mm. Trying to replicate a downtown experience without having actual residents live there is just not sustainable. At least with a traditional downtown, commercial and residential developments are co-located, so there is always going to be that foot traffic even if other stores start dying. In addition, since the stores themselves are smaller, it is easier for them to find new tenants, whereas a mall would need another anchor store the size of Sears to fill where Sears used to be. The mall industry is not booming the same way as it was decades ago. CoreSight research estimated 25% of America's 1,000 malls will close over the next three to five years. This does present a unique opportunity to give dead or dying malls a second life. In my free parking video, I mentioned a development called the Reno Experience District. This is a mixed-use development that is being constructed on the remains of a dead mall. In 2006, the Park Lane Mall closed down, and the lot remained empty for over a decade. In 2018, the land was purchased to create a mixed-use community. When the development is finished, it will feature apartments, a hotel, offices, a theater, and several retailers all within walking distance of each other and along a rapid transit line. This development may be closer to Victor Gruen's original vision of what a mall should represent, because it does have more to offer than a bubble of mindless consumerism. It certainly has its issues, but since it features public spaces for events and housing, in addition to shopping, it is arguably better than a mall that is surrounded by a sea of parking. I know I complained about the luxury tagline in my free parking video, and looking back that was probably a mistake. I don't take issue with the development itself, I just think it is silly that parking is free and abundant due to laws requiring it, while housing is not treated with the same level of priority to ensure that it is abundant and available to anyone who needs it. Anyway, I suppose I should talk about social housing in a future video. My only real complaint about this development is that it is ridiculously car-centric. Each of these apartments are basically wrapped around massive parking garages. It's like they took the asphalt seas that surround malls, sliced them up, and stacked them on top of each other. It is better than having a surface parking lot, but the more you reserve space for parking, the less space you have for more different kinds of amenities. Nevertheless, this may still be an option for how to go about salvaging malls that occupy the urban core. If a dead mall sits on valuable land, it should be redeveloped into something more substantial than a decrepit building where a mall used to be. This should also extend to malls that are still alive. I have many complaints about Meadowood Mall, namely how car-centric it is, but this mall still gets plenty of business, so it does not need to be scrapped and rebuilt in the same way Park Lane Mall was. Instead, this mall just needs to have the surrounding area redeveloped in a way that makes it more pedestrian-friendly. By reclaiming the land that is reserved for cars and developing on the empty lots surrounding Meadowood Mall, there is plenty of space to add the kinds of amenities that Victor Gruen wanted to see in our shopping centers. Sadly, not all shopping centers are going to be salvageable. 
Some of them have been spread so far outward from the urban core that if the anchor stores start dying, there isn't much of a point in redeveloping the area because it's sprawled so far outward that it is no longer sustainable. Meadowood Mall and the Reno Experience District have the advantage of being deep enough into the urban core to be more worth redeveloping. Something like the Summit Mall near Mount Rose Highway does not quite have that advantage. While it is understandable that Gruen wanted to create a place where people could escape from car-dependent suburbia, the mall was the wrong way to go about it. Instead, downtown should be left downtown. After all, he didn't really want to make the mall. He wanted to create a main street for suburbanites. But as long as it has to cater to cars, it will never be as good as a proper street. The underlying issue is that car-dependent suburbia is inherently incompatible with the walkable environments that Victor Gruen wanted to create. Suburbanites need a car to get anywhere, and they will expect or demand ample amounts of parking everywhere they visit, including places that are supposed to replicate a dense walkable downtown. This results in many shopping centers that are merely a row of stores in front of acres of free parking. Rather than trying to inject car-free locations into suburbia, the focus should be densifying and pedestrianizing more of the urban core. Make the downtown a place people want to live in, provide access to various amenities, and ensure that it is easily accessible by walking, biking, or taking transit. Suburbanites, on the other hand, should feel discouraged from taking their vehicles into the city center. They should instead be taking transit, even if that means leaving their vehicle at a park and ride. Creating the ideal shopping center that Victor Gruen envisioned requires focusing on the urban core and revitalizing the actual main streets so it can be a place people live in, work at, shop at, socialize at, and more from a human scale without all the driving that is found in suburbia.